Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on you, wherever you are. It's a great day. We've got some sunny weather, my side here. And uh, I've got an amazing package to present to you. And uh, I've got the title here for you. It's a bit of a scary title. Look at this title. Enemies, traitors, and hypocrites. And the <coughs> source of this presentation today is the ninth chapter of the Holy Quran. It's a harsh chapter. Some people say the um, Basmala or the in the name of Allah, Bismillah rahman rahim was omitted from this chapter because of the harsh content, the nature of the content in this chapter. And if I could give this chapter a title, it would be what you see the enemies, traitors and hypocrites. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk to you about this chapter. What I I got a question from a very, very close friend, family member, you know, Kamil. Assalamu alaikum to you. And um, the question related to a particular verse in this chapter. And this chapter consists of 129 verses. It's the ninth chapter in the uh, Holy Quran. And when I try to answer the question to my dear brother, Kamil, <clears throat> I realize that this is a massive project. This chapter has many aspects to it, and I need to make some more effort. So what I did was I took about three days and I looked at all the various translations, and then I also De and then I decided, in fact, look, the translations that I've got do not do justice to this chapter. And I decided to proceed with putting the chapter over into English as I understand it. Now, as with past presentations or past programs, if you look back at the past videos on the channel, you will see the methodology I used in performing a translation. So it's a very responsible process. It's an involved process, not a process that can be taken lightly because we're dealing here with conveying meaning and meaning is obviously perspective based and I come with my perspective but that does not harm the reading of the Quran because we all read the Quran with a particular perspective. And in my introduction to this YouTube channel, I do declare my perspective. My background is one of being a social activist and being um, sort of concerned with the uh, structures and with the transformation of society. And that is how I read the Quran. And so I, when I do a translation, that is the perspective that I bring to the translation. But I also bring my own preferences and my own history and my own biography and I hope that you know you will understand where I come from and so I did I completed the translation of this chapter it was a tough job it was two nights of little sleep and but I think it was worth it and uh, I'm here to not I can't obviously give you a reading of the entire chapter that would take way too much time but I want to highlight to you the important issues and points that come out from this chapter 9 in the holy book and I think you will find the issues very fascinating by the way what I will do is I will put a link in the description of uh, this video to my translation and so you can I'll send you the entire I'll put up the entire translation and remember it's work in progress so if you can find any typos or improvements do 
uh, send those to me and I will very, very highly appreciate that. So let me talk about this chapter. Um, and by the way, this might be a quite long video. So if you don't have time right now, I think you need to make time and just sit back and watch this. But this is fascinating. I promise you it is worth, absolutely worth uh, looking at what comes out. Because it's not, I'm not saying that my contribution is worth it. I'm saying that getting insight into the message coming out of the Quran is really worth it when it comes to this chapter. And so let me give you some idea of how I want to approach this video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at about four or five. First of all, the, the content or the context of the chapter. To give you a bit of context, I want to set out the actors that are really important players in this chapter, Surah Tawbah, the ninth chapter. And then I want to do with you the issues that come out in this chapter. So let me let me first start by looking at the context of this chapter. Now this chapter, the context in which it plays off is at, on the eve of a major war or a major battle. That's the bulk of the chapter at least. And um, the important battle here is that is referred to is a battle called the Battle of, of uh, Tabuk or the Tabuk Expedition. And um, the context is that the Prophet is mobilizing for a massive um, war to take place somewhere in the north of Arabia. And so this probably becomes the biggest mobilization in the history. The time is about in the last two years of the prophetic mission. So in other words, we're looking at 20, more than 20 years into the mission of the prophet. Um, it's a time when a great many victories had already been achieved. So the battle of Badr, where the first battle took place, that had already been achieved. Further victories at uh, Hunayn, uh, Mecca has already been um, taken. And so the Arabian Peninsula is largely now under the control of the Prophet, of the Messenger Muhammad alayhi salam. And uh, so the new Muslim state of Medina has suddenly become very, very important and sort of the most important power on the peninsula. And so a great many of the wealthy people and the powerful uh, elite, etc., have already now embraced uh, the new religion of Islam. They've uh, adopted the prophet or the messenger as their leader. And so the picture is now one of a successful new state, the state of Medina, which now has suzerainty or control over almost the entire Arabian Peninsula. So that is the context. Um, that's the political environment, sorry. And uh, the prophet is the undisputed head of the peninsula right now. But there are areas in the north of the peninsula which are not really uh, yet under the control of the um, of the Muslim state in Medina. And those areas are controlled or under the control of the Byzantine or the, or the Roman Empire, uh, which at that stage is a Christian empire, it's a Christian power. And um, when it comes to Medina, a lot of wealth because of all the victories and all the battles and obviously much booty collected in many of the battles on the peninsula and so much wealth in Medina, in the city of the Prophet. And um, the particular time is very important when this mobilization takes place. It's, um, it's at 
the end of the summer season at the th at the summer months and um so the heat is still fairly severe in fact if you think about summertime the worst part of summer is probably at the end of summer or maybe the first month of autumn in fact i know that's the case here with us when it comes to february in the southern hemisphere it really becomes hot and then march still is a hot month and i think in the northern hemisphere it would be September, I guess. Um, and then, so although September being autumn, it's still hot. And that was the month in which this mobilization took place. And so it's also the month of the harvest. And so the new uh, elite, the new rich, the newly um, victorious state of Medina, um, now has an opportunity to focus on the crops, the farming and the businesses which are all flourishing at this time. And, 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 and the peninsula is, is one. There's no, there's no further towns or villages to be conquered. The peninsula is taken. So the prophet is now mobilizing for a battle to take place like re really on the fringes of the peninsula almost outside the peninsula and what this chapter deals with is the dynamics that unfold when the nouveau uh, rich the is the newly established empire um, or not empire but at least uh, you know powerful state on the peninsula uh, faces the challenge of now continuing the sacrifice and continuing to defend and um, entrench the value system which the prophet or the messenger of God brought. And those, and that is the context of this, uh, in which this uh, chapter unfolds. Right in the beginning, it doesn't really seem as if that is the context because right in the beginning it actually addresses um, the treaty and I think the chapter might have been revealed in stages so that part of the chapter was revealed on the eve of a different battle and that was the conquest of Mecca and um, if we just look take a look at uh, the chapter quickly um, let's look at the the chapter quickly and this is the start as you can see in this chapter there's no basmala there's no bismillah which is normally in the name of god uh, the kind master of all fortunes as i translate it but in this chapter it simply starts with a sort of a strongly worded few verses and let me let me go through those verses with you quickly and and, and you'll see the tone is immediately um fairly harsh and, st and, and, and stern and it says it says yeah and this time i'm just going to read the english um when you get uh, like i said you can get a copy of this this is the translation that i've worked on of course as i've mentioned notice is given of a dissolution of all treaty obligations towards the relevant pagans by allah via his messenger so the first verse gives notice that the treaty is null and void so the treaty that had been in place and we know that there was a treaty um, between the Meccans and the Muslims um, and that treaty basically stipulated a few um, arrangements uh, where war would be reserved. But yeah, the treaty is, of course, what, what we see here is that the treaty is declared null and void. The next verse, and I'm not going to go through all of them, I just want to set the tone for them, for this, for this chapter. The notice being, though you may take four months to roam about without molestation be aware that you cannot thwart Allah and that Allah will disgrace the denialists and so 
the tone starts and we are introduced to the chapter very stern and the tone does not relent as the chapter continues and I've done the translation out of 129 verses the tone stays very stern and that is why people call the surah Tawbah and so let me then continue with dealing with this chapter and how are we going to deal with this chapter what I want to then do is to look at like I said the context the actors and the issues raised in this chapter so the issues raised in this chapter would be um, the, the, the context and then the actors let me just quickly get there the actors so who are the actors in this chapter in this chapter when you read it there are four there are many actors obviously more than four but there are four important um, characters or players in the unfolding drama and remember I sketched to you the context and where this takes place it's hot people's crops are ready harvest time is there um, they are wealthy they are comfortable they've already won most of the peninsula and now the prophet is mobilizing an army so in this chapter you get first of all what I translate and we we often this is one of the most common terms in the Quran and that is the mu'minun the mu'minun and now very commonly we all know that word as the believers the believers but when I translate I don't get that feel of what a believer is you see a believer is a static believing somebody is a static action and a mu'min is definitely not a, a static attitude it's an attitude that has diamond, uh, dynamism in and that is why I do translate it as the affirmers so being a mu'min means endorsing or affirming or or, 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 or agreeing with or you know believing but the, the word belief is, is is really it's it's static and the di dynamism in the term comes dynas uh, uh, the term that would be more dynamic in conveying the meaning of a mu'min is an affirmer so just to make it a bit more clear I use the word a truth affirmer and so that's the one important actor in the unfolding drama are those who are unflinching affirmers and endorsers of Allah of God of the Prophet of the book of the day of judgment who affirm these as unquestionable truths beyond any doubt and that is what they affirm and in the context of this um, unfolding drama within this chapter the believers are definitely given due recognition due respect due um, uh, 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 you know uh, uh, respect and um, because they are unflinching they are unquestionable they 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 they, they are you know without any question or doubt they are ready to suck to uh, join the army and to sacrifice whatever they have and whatever wealth and they are prepared to get on board and join the army and be mobilized within the army the second um, actor that is highlighted in this chapter and that uh, appears at many places are the truth deniers and the word al kuffar the plural of the word kafir now a kafir is a rejecter the word kafir means somebody who turns away or rejects or denies or is in denial and that is the second category of person covered in this chapter and the truth deniers are out and out you know 
rejected or, or, or shunned or condemned. And there's no place in this chapter where any truth denier is treated very kindly. The third uh, uh, actor that is highlighted in this chapter very prominently is what uh, is called a munafiq, the munafikun, or the hypocrites. And these are the people who make a pretense of being on the side of truth. These are the characters that make a pretense of being on the side of truth. And um, they, they don't really uh, agree with, you know, they've got an agenda that really conflicts with those who are fighting for truth. And then the fourth category that I want to list in this, in reading this chapter, are the cowards or the uh, al-khawalif. Now, these are the people who are also, who can also be referred to as the recalcitrants or the laggers, the, the, those who drag their feet, those who are one foot in and one foot out. And they feature very, very prominently in this chapter. And so we will also, they are also an important player in this chapter. And so these are the actors that form part of the unfolding drama. And uh, what I, I want to show you um, how this story is recorded in history. Um, now, Haikal, or the, um, you know, the famous Egyptian uh, secular writer, has produced a, 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 an, a, an autobiography, or sorry, an autobiography of the prophet. And he covers this particular um, incident, uh, the mobilization the the, 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 the the mobilization of hardship or what they call the Jeshu Osra. And um, I want to show you some of the words that he refers to. You know, he says, uh, Aiko says, he says, um, how were the Muslims to receive this new call to leave their families and properties in the height of summer heat to venture in desolate and waterless deserts and to confront an enemy powerful enough to defer, defeat Persia and even too mighty to be defeated by the Muslims. Would their Islamic conviction, love for the Prophet, and loyalty to God's religion inspire them to give up wealth, armor, and life, and to do so in such proportion as to instill terror in the heart of such an enemy? Or would the discomforts of desert and summer heat, of thirst and hunger, force them to sit back and refuse to move? In those days, Muslim ranks included two kinds of people. Those who entered Islam with hearts full of guidance and light and minds certain of their convictions and those who did so in search of material gain or out of fear of Muslim armies. So what you can see here is that he narrates the, 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 the context. Let's look then at some of the verses within this chapter that relates or refers to these uh, uh, different actors. And let's look at the, the first one would be, let's, let's look at the truth deniers firstly. And what does it say here? What, what are we reading here? In this particular verse 32 in chapter 9 it says, their wish is to put out the light of Allah with their bogus claims, but Allah will deny this to them for the sake of perfecting his light, though the truth deniers find it abhorrent. Let's look at another verse that refers to these characters. This is also quite a harsh one here. This is verse 68 in the same chapter. Allah promises the hypocrites 
men and women and the truth deniers, the kuffar in other words, the fire of hell, where they will spend eternity. This is what they deserve. Allah has cursed them and their punishment will be enduring. Let's look at another verse. Again, verse 73 referring to the truth deniers. Hear this, dear prophet. Make every effort at combating the truth deniers and the hypocrites and remain firm against them. Their abode is hell, an evil refuge indeed. Desert Arabs, another verse, 97. Desert Arabs are the most extreme truth deniers and hypocrites and most likely to be ignorant of the parameters which Allah has revealed via his messenger. Allah remains steeped in knowledge with perfect judgment. There you get an idea of how the truth deniers are regarded. And I don't want you to think of the truth deniers as, you know, innocent lambs that are being treated unjustly in the Holy Quran. We should remember here that these are the people that have visited every form of oppression, exploitation, enslavement of the people of Arabia. These are the power elite um, and their henchmen and their lackeys and their sheeple that have followed them and that have blindly executed their schemes throughout the peninsula, that have kept an entire nation in submission and in ignorance and, you know, in every form of exploitation. If you really go and you look at the lives of women under the under the rule of these uh, denialists, uh, the, the, the lot of women, it is a terrible lot, you know, women were exploited, were oppressed, had very few rights, babies were buried alive, um, girl babies were buried alive, um, killing was done without batting an eye, you know, the, the, the wiping out of people, the, you know, just senseless rule of tyranny that was perpetrated on the peninsula not for not for 10 years but probably for more than a hundred years or for hundreds of years and this is the terrible life that the prophet has emerged in to address and to free those people in fact there's a particular verse right at the end of the chapter that says very clearly that paints the picture of the condition that the prophet had um, emerged in and just look at this particular verse here look at this verse it's so beautiful it's often recited it's it's verse 128 in other words it's almost at the end of the chapter the pre the the the, the penultimate verse of the chapter says and i'm going to read the arabic here لقد جاءكم رسول من انفسكم عزيز عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف الرحيم so when we think of the truth rejectors or the truth uh, deny, deniers you should think of it in this context where the, the, the reality is sketched that a messenger has approached you from your own midst with a deep concern for the fallen state you were in filled with anxiety for you and feeling deep love and kindness for those who endorse him and as you can see this penultimate verse and let me look at the the final verse also just as a matter of interest the chapter closes off with us and it says should they abandon you the people of medina your people that you have now liberated then tell them, sufficient for me is Allah. No God is there except He. On Him I depend. And He remains the Lord and Master of the Most Supreme Throne. And the beautiful ending of that chapter is, it, it almost like at the end sketches the bigger picture, is that we have had a fallen 
nation, a nation that had become um, thoroughly rotten to the core, where the elite, the powerful, had entrenched themselves and had rendered the weaker sections of society almost completely powerless. Women, children, the elderly, the orphans, and where wars and economic exploitation were the order of the day. Doesn't it sound familiar? You know, this chapter, when you read it, I can't help finding the echoes in our times. And when you think of what we call here the truth deniers, I cannot help but find an equivalence with the great exploiters of our time, the great warmongers of our time, those who have inflicted the most harsh and inhuman treatment on sections of the population of the world. You know, I live in a country here where half of the country is rendered absolutely almost penniless and subject to the most abject poverty and squalor. And where a small group of super rich elite members of society are, are, are creaming it, are enjoying the fruits of all the suffering. Not only here, but throughout the rest of Africa, we have a situation with civil wars, where countries are being rendered, uh, you know, are, 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 are turned into a living hell for the people who live there. A country like the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where Western uh, nations are signing agreements with warlords to mine the diamonds and providing them with all sorts of murderous uh, a weaponry to secure the spot or the space where the diamonds or the land where the diamonds are being mined and where these militias and militaries are absolutely heartless when it comes to the innocent sections of the population. So we see it here, but you know, you can cast your mind further away. You can, you can think about, you know, the exploitation of the oil in the Middle East. The ex we know Africa is being is being uh, uh, suffocated and being um, in culturally squashed because of the natural um, mineral wealth within the soil of Africa. But if you look at the Middle East, you know the same. Tyrants and dictators are being kept. Go, uh, you know, the, the dictators who, who are there today are more or less very, very similar to the dictators that the prophet had to eject and destroy in his time. And those same Arabs, in fact, this one verse just referred to them now, the desert Arabs, are now ruling Arabia. These are the people that are beheading uh, people at random, you know, innocent religious leaders uh, like uh, Sheikh Malik, Hassan uh, uh, Maliki, uh, Hassan Farhan Maliki, an innocent man, a man who promotes a clean Quranic approach to Islam, arrested and facing the death penalty. So the barbarism that the Prophet had experienced or had to combat and eradicate in the 1400 years ago has made a full return, unfortunately. And so when we talk about the truth deniers, we are we have to keep in mind that the Quran is extremely harsh on them because these are an extremely criminal people. Because when you deny truth, when you deny reality, then you affirm falsehood, then you affirm um, oppression, then you affirm injustice when you deny truth. And so truth denial is probably one of the worst crimes that one could find. And it is a necessity of being a truth affirmer that we should go to war with those who are truth in us. And that's exactly what this chapter says here. I'd like to point you to, to one of the verses that speak very eloquently of that. Look at this verse here. This is verse 123 in the chapter. It says, Hear this you who made the affirmation. Confront those in close contact with you who deny truth and let them find no compromise in you. Be aware though 
that Allah is on the side of those who practice pious restraint. And so the truth affirms those who fight for truth, those who stand for truth, the mu'mineen must not even allow within the immediate circle for truth denial to flourish and it should be squashed as soon as it is encountered and so the idea of the truth deniers as i've mentioned to you um there is no compromise there is no compromise and the quran states it very very clearly that it should be confronted now the hypocrites um we can look at a few verses that refer to the hypocrites also and um, let's let's look at let's look at some of them look at this particular verse here that refers to the doings and the workings of the hypocrites and it says the hypocrites men and women and you don't only get men hypocrites you get of both genders the hypocrites men and women mutually work with one another they advocate for that which is foul. They advocate for that which is foul and advocate against that which is sound, all the time refusing to reveal their hands. They have forsaken Allah and Allah has forsaken them. Hypocrites are without doubt evildoers. That's a very powerful verse, and that is the second element or the second or the third in, in my list here that I've highlighted. Now there are more verses in this chapter that that discuss and that expose the idea of a hypocrite and the concept that comes out here is that really the actual agenda is to promote what is foul and to prevent what is good and you know and, and, and then while all the time covering their hands not revealing their plans. So in other words, acting clandestinely. So executing the agenda in 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 sort of uh, under with by, by in, in with smoke in mirrors as they say. Uh, not revealing the agenda. And that is the concept of the hypocrite. And in this particular chapter the hypocrite is very very much exposed. So the other um, actor that I haven't covered and I'm not going to go into the Mu'minun because they are really I've covered the subject in other videos so let me show you what we refer to as the cowards then because they are also a special type of character that features within the new community you know when we when we look at the cowards or the Khawalif uh, or the laggers those who are recalcitrant um, in fact in his biography in his history of the prophet um, he covers the point and uh, maybe we should just have a look at what a says about this he, he writes upon the Muslims return from this battlefield from Tabuk those who failed to answer the call to mobilize and remain behind came to give account of their failure they were given such harsh judgment that all those of questionable faith, including those soldiers who derided the outcome of the campaign just concluded, trembled in fear. And so the, 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 um, what he calls the recalcitrant, I refer to them as the cowards or the laggers, uh, they were they they were a very prominent feature within this battle a very prominent presence in this battle and take a look at this verse that speaks about them in this chapter this particular verse is if there was an immediate gain and the journey easy they would no they would all without doubt have followed you the distance was long however and weighed on them remember when they made the excuse saying, if we only could, we would have joined the battle with you. Through this cowardice, they brought devastation on themselves for Allah, knew that they were lying. And 
so that is an example of you know these role players or these actors that i refer to as the the the, the cowards or the fence sitters or this uh, uh, uh <laughs> and uh there's, there's some harsh words also used for them in this particular verse look at this other verse in in verse 83 should you ever be reunited with any of these groupings and should they in future ask your permission to join the battle you should tell them never will you accompany me to any battle ever again nor will you join me in confronting any enemy your pre your preference the first time was to rest on your laurels so go and be seated with the cowardly laggers and so the the cowards is another important aspect and um, you know i'm uh, i'm also reminded you know when i look around me at the majority of people you know we this 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 youtube channel and this video we're not we're not we're not producing material here that is for entertainment only it's good it's well and good if you if you enjoy listening and watching and you know getting into the material but um i think we my desire and my my motivation is to be a force for transformation a force for change a force for emancipation and when i look at these typologies or these actors i don't look at them from a theoretical perspective because although i can be theoretical uh, i'm i'm more my emphasis is more on the activism side and i try to identify the role players or the actors within the quran and i try to identify these realities or these actors and these characters in the real world around me now i've already identified for you the truth deniers right those are the people that are out and out going to reject truth and they are in it to advance the, the interests of the elite and the interests of the status quo and those who are in the ruling powers in the land and on earth um the hypocrites i mentioned to you the same but basically concealing the agenda so in other words the same agenda as the truth deniers but with a public face that appears um friendly towards the oppressed or towards those who are in fact uh, advancing truth and uh, i can't help but think of the words of our great late great ashaid Malik Al Shabazz Malcolm X who says that um, in the north they are political foxes and in the south they political wolves and uh, no matter which one you choose you'll still be in the dog house so you know the hypocrite being the fox being the sly one being the deceptive um uh, force within the greater a uh, structure of truth denial is no different from the brutal and blunt a uh, uh, naked aggressor aggressive truth de uh, denier but um, we should we should we should focus on the coward also because the coward really is um what i'm most worried about and in my society and throughout the world and in fact in your society also the biggest problem are those who know what is right they've actually realized that there is an oppressive system in place that something ought to be done but they have not mustered the courage or the will power they still just have a bit too much to lose to invest their lives or their wealth or their possessions or their assets into the battle and this to me is a absolutely sad situation a sad case you know where people are unwilling to invest or to commit to the liberatory struggle to the movement to eject the forces of oppression the forces of injustice the forces of falsehood and um so the coward really is a major problem facing us and as we see here in this verse the coward is not dealt with kid gloves 
here the coward is exposed and the coward is, is, is regarded as not fit for the companionship of the prophet. And so a very, very important aspect of the struggle. And when I look at um, our world, my country, your country probably, wherever you are in Europe or America or on the African continent, we have work to be done. We have an oppressive system to oppose and to possibly overthrow. And we need to commit. We need enough people to commit. Now, it is, it is an interesting fact that you don't actually need 90% of the population to overturn an evil and unjust system. Uh, some have argued that as little as 5% of the population when thoroughly activated and thoroughly committed in terms of investing themselves and all their assets and their wealth into the struggle are, are very, very capable of overturning an evil and corrupt system. And in fact, um, that is exactly what this chapter states here. Look at this particular verse here where where, where, the, where the Almighty speaks and says, on the other hand, they are the messenger and those who made the affirmation of truth with him, who strive and struggle, offering their wealth and themselves. For them, they are all good things, are all good things, and it is they who will prosper very very powerful verse that states the requirement for good to be victorious over evil and so we have exhausted i think a discussion on these different uh, character types which this chapter highlights and uh, surah toba or the ninth chapter of the quran as is the entire Quran, is a manifesto for revolution. My brothers and sisters, if you haven't come to that conclusion yet, then you need to read it more and you will find no other conclusion but that the Quran is a manifesto, it's a program, it's a guiding manual for overturning or overthrowing corruption and evil on earth. And these different actors are very important. They highlight the type of people which the prophet, the leader in the fourth, in the in, in, in the in the sixth or seventh century of the common era, the, the revolutionary leader, the Prophet Muhammad, who liberated the Arabian Peninsula in his lifetime, the revolutionary program that he followed, it shows the type of of people that he had to deal with. And so now we come to the final part of this discussion, which is the issues that are raised in this chapter. And so I'm going to quickly remember that was what we said we were going to do. In the first slide, I said we are going to look at the context the actors and the issues raised. Right? So let us look at the issues that are raised in this chapter. First of all, the social goals, the goals of the mu'min or the society of truth affirmers, the society of mu'minun, the Quranic society, the society that is righteous, just and assertive of truth and righteousness and justice. What are the goals of that society? Now, if you've seen my videos, what you will know is that I'm not a religious um, nutcase. I'm not here telling you to become a Muslim, telling you to, you know, to follow my religion. I'm bringing you to the message of the Quran, which is a revolutionary message of emancipation. And let me point you to the social goals of this message. 
The social goals are spelt out very clearly in this chapter also, as they are spelt out throughout the Holy Quran. And one of the social goals, and I'm going to use the Quran extensively now to illustrate to you what the social goals are of this process of emancipation. The first goal that I see here is that the society, a society, an ideal society that is based on justice, on stability, on peace, on harmony, you know, and devoid of oppression and exploitation is the society that is um, idealized by the Quran. Look at this verse here. Look at this verse here. The affirmers of truth, and we're looking at verse 71 of chapter 9. The affirmers of truth, both men and women, are guardians of each other, social solidarity. They advocate for what is sound and advocate against what is foul. So first of all, we are, we are, we are discovering the goals for which the process of battle and struggle and emancipation is for. And first of all, the affirmers of truth, both men and women, just look at the the, the non-sexist approach of the Quran. It, it, it actually emphasizes men and women are guardians of each other. First of all, social solidarity. They advocate for what is sound. So what we know is good and healthy for society, the greater benefit of society, that is what we should advocate for and that is what the, the, the position of the government, the, the, the just government is, is to advocate for what is sound. So we cannot have government that advocates for debt, for pornographic exploitation, for um, uh, 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 exploitation. So these foul things are to be advocated against. They advocate against what is foul. So the just government that is idealized in the Quran is a government that will advocate against what is harmful or illegitimate or unhealthy to society. And those are not things that are mysterious or unfathomable. You know, we have the ability to uncover or to discover those things that are harmful and beneficial to society while establishing general adherence and promoting moral and social refinement now let me again harp on the concept general adherence now you see i've spoken about this the Quran, unfortunately, in a previous presentation, I have illustrated to you how the meaning of many of the terms of the Quran has been robbed from the book. The word salat is a much richer term. It is a term that refers to solid social solidarity, to connectedness, to outreach, to um, general adherence, to a social structure. And so what if we look at the meaning of the word salah in that sense where it is general adherence, lawfulness uh, and not lawlessness, um, then the word actually gets its meaning, comes into its own year. And it says here, and at establishing general adherence, the rule of law, you know, connectedness is one of the ideals of the Quranic society. And then the next point, promoting moral and social refinement. So what is moral refinement? It is an attitude of um, counteracting the lower base instincts. Moral refinement is taking the higher road in terms of human desire, uh, you know, the, the, the profane uh, element within humanity. It is to take the higher road in terms of the, the, the base human instincts, right? 
that is morality that is sexual morality that is morality in terms of business and so the the quranic ideal society is one that promotes moral refinement right so it is moral upliftment and the word zakah in particular is the word that is used here social refinement is is similarly is where society as a whole takes care of the weak and does not overlook or ignore or stand apathetic towards the needs of the weak and the less fortunate and obeying Allah and his messenger so that brings the spiritual element so the Quranic society is not a society that is purely pragmatic and moral and um, egalitarian it is also very very importantly grounded in a commitment and in a uh, devotion to the creator of the universe and to his messenger these are the people that Allah will shower with benefits for Allah is the mighty one with perfect judgment and so I point you again to the social goals which we are referring to and uh, definitely clearly spelled out in this specific verse here uh, but not only are there social goals there are also spiritual goals uh, there are also spiritual goals what do we mean by spiritual goals um, now spiritual goals my own understanding of what it is to be spiritual it means to be transcendent of the present world it is to be transcendent within your uh, ideal uh, ideal uh, uh, idealizing of the future and within your um, the shaping of your um, worldview it is to transcend the immediate the mundane and to incorporate an element of the sublime in your existence and for me that is what spiritual means in other words it is to aspire to more than the present world and existence that we find ourselves in and of course the Quran sketches that abundantly look at this particular verse where the Quran speaks about this transcendent outlook of the mu'min and it says Allah promises to the affirmers of truth both men and women again the non-sexist um, attitude in the Quran Allah promised them flowing gardens beneath which streams flow where they will spend eternity there they occupy fine lodgings amidst gardens of bliss ultimate bliss lies in gaining Allah's satisfaction that will constitute the pinnacle of success and so this element of sub, this the sublime element is an essential part of the Quranic society as it is spelt out in this so not only are we the pragmatic society that is there to enhance good and to dispel evil and to ensure a, a system of fairness and justice <clears throat> but we are also there to cultivate and instill a sublime and a transcendent spiritual awareness within the citizens of such a society and that comes out very very clearly in this surah toba because all the verses i've shown you are from surah toba let us move on and look at another um, um, goal in the society you see the society also that is promoted in this chapter is a society that transcends personal interest we're living in a world where personal interest dictates pretty much the ideals and the aspirations of every person within the realm of the Western world and even within my society it is personal interests personal ambitions uh, personal um, uh, 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 aspirations that really dictate our behavior our actions and our values and our principles but the Quran decries that sort of 
th th those that that value system and offers an alternative value system look at this verse here where in surah tawbah in this chapter 9 we are told by the almighty tell them if you love your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your spouses and your close friends and your accumulated wealth and your business which you fear may decline and your comfortable homes more than you love Allah and his messenger and striving in his way then just wait and see when the command of Allah comes to pass Allah will not show the way to a wicked people so I'm not going to offer you more verses because we're already running close or over an hour here but what I want to just emphasize here is that the interest or the self interest that drives people's dreams and hopes and aspirations in Western society in a country like South Africa also are really what keeps the population of the nation enslaved because none of us are prepared to part or to risk or to put uh, on the line uh, you know our comfortable homes our businesses our jobs our security uh, our family our social acceptability and so these values and these principles that we all cling to are the very values and principles that are based on self-interest and that really keep up the structure the superstructure of oppression and exploitation and that is what the Quran decries and it calls for a principled stand it calls for us to abandon these precious um, sacred objects and to look at a greater goal which is the establishment of the ideal society and so I think I'm going to wrap up on that note social goals spiritual goals personal interests versus greater good those would be the themes or the important um, issues that are also raised in Surah Tawbah and um, I will then leave it to you to maybe reflect on these thoughts that I've provided for your benefit and um, if you can download the translation I've got all the work that I've done thus far it's about a quarter of the holy book or maybe a fifth of the holy book that I've completed and done the translation and I as I say my translation is influenced by my perspective which is a social emancipatory perspective perspective which I truly believe the Quran is a most excellent um, document or manifesto of so thank you for um, joining me for this extended session I hope uh, you found it enriching um, do go and read Surah Tawbah uh, you know you can read it even in any in, in, in Yusuf Ali's book also uh, Yusuf Ali's translation or Pickthor or um, any other modern translation uh, Mustafa Khattab I think has a translation um, and so go and read the the book the, the chapter 9 of the Quran and go and see um, if you can see if you can get the gist or the idea that I've gotten from it it's basically a chapter that speaks about caring for war preparing to fight and the obstacles and the challenges which we experience in the process of mobilizing society to undertake the noble struggle and the noble battle thank you very much for watching wassalamu alaikum peace be on you